Hello and welcome to Classic Books with Ostara. And we've been recently reading uh, Plato's Republic Book 1. We've been on the summary and we are getting ready to begin on to the summary of, with Thrasmachus and Socrates. And let's just get right to that. Thrasmachus and Socrates discuss justice. At this, this point, uh, Thrasmachus jumps in with Socrates and, and Cephalus. He's been trying to uh, interrupt the debate the whole time, and now he, he just can't control himself. He's getting really antsy. He's really worked up. He accuses Socrates of spouting nonsense and presses him to actually provide his own answer just instead of just questioning other people's answers all the time. And Thrasymachus doesn't want Socrates to be vague anymore. He's tired of his vagueness. Socrates was kind of taken aback by uh, the violent interruption. Him and Polemarchus actually both were. Socrates gets his wits about him and and answers that if he and Polemarchus has made a mistake, it was completely unintentional. They just both want to really know what justice means. They they are they're motivated but not incompetent. Thrasmachus is not impressed with this. He laughs and accuses Socrates of being ironic as usual instead of just actually answering questions. Socrates defends himself again by saying that Thrasmachus made the questions impossible to answer by limiting the way he could answer. A person can only answer in the way they know. Thrasmachus then challenges Socrates. Uh, he, goes, he says, what will Socrates do if he, Thrasmachus, can find justice in a way better way than Socrates can. Socrates says he'll happily learn from Thrasmachus, but if Thrasmachus wants money, which Socrates says he doesn't have, then Glaucon stepped in and says Socrates does have some money and they should go ahead with the challenge. Everyone else present will support Socrates, which Thra uh, Thrasmachus thinks is a typical of Socrates' tricks. Socrates asks Thrasmachus wh why he would expect him to be able to answer since he has never claimed to be able to know anything. It's Thrasmachus who claims to have an answer. Thrasmachus continues to act as if he didn't want to answer, though Socrates suspects that he really wants to show off how good his answer is. Then Thrasmachus accuses Socrates of learning from other people without teaching anything in return. Socrates agrees that he learns from others but objects to the idea that he gives nothing in return. He admits he has no money but he will repay wisdom with high praise. Thrasmachus defines the just as simply the advantage of the stronger. He says Socrates ought to praise him but knows he won't. Socrates says he first needs to understand and asks if Thrasmachus is saying that, a, say, a wrestler, because he is stronger than himself, would therefore be more than just the pre more just than the present company. Thrasmachus is not impressed and says Socrates is twisting his meaning, showing it in the worst possible light. He was only talking about political strength. He says, for like all three types of ruling systems, democracy, tyranny, and aristocracy, there are corresponding laws that make whatever is good for the rulers just and whatever isn't good for the rulers unjust. Socrates is intrigued, though he also points out that Thrasymachus has answered in the way he forbade Socrates from doing earlier. Socrates says he's, he's all for... The idea of connecting justice and advantage, but isn't sure if it's in the advantage of the stronger that is important. Socrates presents Thrasmachus with one of his 
famous examples. The example is strong rulers. Thrasmachus agrees that it's just to obey rulers, but he also agrees that rulers can sometimes make mistakes. Socrates therefore shows that if a ruler mistakenly forced one of his subjects to do something unjust, thinking it was just and to his own advantage, it would mean that according to Thrasmachus' definition, something unjust would be just simply because a ruler commanded it. Polemarchus jumps in here and enthusiastically agrees with Socrates' reasoning. So I think he's basically saying that just because a ruler commands something doesn't mean it's correct. Sometimes bad rules are made to be broken. Clytophon isn't as convinced with Socrates' reasoning. He insists that Thrasmachus didn't say justice was what was to the advantage of the stronger, the rulers in this example, but what seemed to be. So according to Clytophon, Thrasmachus is still correct. So Socrates then runs this interpretation by Thrasmachus, who immediately says that this is not at all what he meant. Instead, he insists that what he, what he was describing, someone is stronger, he was speaking about this person in general and obviously not in the single. A few moments when he or she is making a mistake. Socrates says he didn't realize that that's what Thrasmachus was saying, which bug, really bugged uh, Thrasmachus. Thrasmachus accuses Socrates of being someone who makes needless and self-serving accusations, and he again says that a ruler or a doctor is overall a strong person, even if you wouldn't necessarily describe him that way in those instances when he makes a mistake. Socrates then asks Thrasmachus, if he thinks that he, Socrates, makes these self-serving accusations because he's trying to ruin Thrasmachus' ability to argue. Thrasmachus says he doesn't know, but he doesn't care, and he isn't going to let Socrates derail him. Socrates suggests that they get back to the issue and ask Thrasmachus to clarify this whole situation. He asks whether Thrasmachus is talking about really precise and exact definitions, or just the one regular people throw around. Thrasmachus says he's totally precise and challenges Socrates to find a problem with his reasoning. We think he should probably realize that's a bad idea but now, but hey, that's just me. If you want to take on the big guy, be our guest, so to speak. Socrates takes up his uh, usual strategy by giving examples in response. He asks whether Thrasmachus considers a real doctor, doctor to be one who makes money or cares for the sick, to which Thrasmachus surprisingly says, one who cares for the sick. Next, Socrates asks about pilots, and he and Thrasmachus both conclude that a pilot would be considered a ruler of sailors and not a sailor himself, because even though he sails, he's a pilot due to his role as a leader. I guess back then, pilots were pilots of the sea and not of the air. Same concept. Socrates asks if all objects or practices aim only for their own perfection, making them completely self-sufficient, or if all subjects are also involved and need aspects of other subjects to find their greatest advantages. Thrasmachus suggests that a subject should confine itself to his own concerns. So Socrates clarifies that medicine in that case is concerned with the body and not with medicine itself, just as horsemanship would concern itself with horses and not with horses and not with horsemanship itself. Socrates demonstrates that according to this breakdown, a subject doesn't actually look to his own advantage, as Thrasmachus has previously claimed, but rather to the advantage of the things it is in charge of. A good doctor doesn't try to do the best thing for himself, but for his patients, and the same is true of a pilot and his sailors. So Socrates shows that Thrasmachus' entire definition of a ruler is flawed because a true ruler isn't worried about himself but about the things under his or its control. Thrasmachus isn't too happy about the way the argument's going at this point. So he starts insulting Socrates. He basically calls him a moron. 
that does Socrates really think that, say, a shepherd is concerned only for the welfare of his sheep and not with the food and clothing the sheep will provide him? And on top of that, Thrasmachus says, anyone can see that people who are truly just are actually much worse off than those who are unjust. I guess that depends on your perspective. The real answer, Thrasmachus claims, is that justice is something that is to the advantage of other people, while being unjust is something that is to your own advantage. Again, depending on whose perspective. After announcing this, Thrasmachus almost tries to leave in a huff, but no one will let him. They want to think more about what he has just said. And anyway, and well, I think it's basically because Thrasmachus just showed his true colors. He's, he's kind of a self-serving person. So. They want to think more about what he has just said. And anyway, Socrates reminds him that the topic at hand is a crucial importance for everyday life. Socrates goes on to say that by staying, Thrasmachus is looking out for his friends and making sure they have adequate knowledge of how the world works. Good one for, for Socrates there. And besides, Socrates isn't convinced by Thrasmachus' reasoning. He doesn't believe that injustice is more profitable than justice, and he wants Thrasmachus to prove his point. Thrasmachus says that if Socrates wasn't persuaded already, he can't say anything more to convince him. Socrates ignores this and says that's clear from Thrasmachus' description of a shepherd as someone who takes care of a sheep for primarily selfish reasons. That his definition of ruling has changed since his previous definition of ruling as a doctor as someone who cares for his patients. Basically, he's... Uh, Thrasmachus doesn't know what he's talking about. Socrates asks if rulers of cities rule willingly, and Thrasmachus says, he is sure they do. Socrates says that other kinds of rulers are given a salary or compensation, which suggests that they consider ruling to be for the benefit of those they rule and not just for their own benefit. Socrates returns to the topic of dis disciplines, or Specifically, talking about how, oh, excuse me, how each discipline is differentiated on the basis of the thing it deals with. Pilots, sailing, doctors, medicine. Socrates points out that the only thing various disciplines have in common is that each incorporates the practice of collecting wages to help people make a living. A doctor isn't any less of a doctor because he makes money doing it. Socrates asks whether a doctor will gain any obvious benefit to himself from practicing medicine if he didn't charge a fee. And Thrasmachus admits that he wouldn't. Therefore, Socrates concludes that ruling does not bring its own advantage, but an incentive needs to be added. It could be money or honor or the fear of a penalty if the person doesn't rule. Laucon joins in and says he doesn't understand the last bit about a penalty. Socrates explains that truly good men, the kind you want to be in charge, you want to be in charge, aren't solely interested in either money or honor. Therefore, they are motivated to rule because they are afraid that if they don't, someone bad might rule instead. Which is a really good reason to rule instead of wanting to rule just for pure glory. So Socrates guesses that in a city of truly good men, People would do their best to avoid ruling. They wouldn't try to rule as so many people do now. Socrates says he wants to go back and examine Thrasmachus' claim that the unjust man is stronger than the just one. He asks Glaucon what he thinks. And Glaucon says he believes that the life of the just man ought to be the stronger one. Socrates then suggests they try and convince Thrasmachus, not by having everyone deliver and compare long speeches, but by means of a dialogue. Socrates turns to Thrasmachus and asks him what kind of moral differentiation is possible if Thrasmachus believes that justice is weak and injustice is strong. Thrasmachus replied that he wouldn't use the langu language of virtue and vice, 
Button said would call justice very high-minded innocence and injustice good counsel. But he does imply that injustice would belong in the category of virtue. This last implication bothers Socrates quite a bit. He begins to ask Thrasymachus about the behavior of a hypothetical just man. Would this man ever try to get the better of another person? Answer, no. Socrates asks if this just man would think he deserved to at least get the better of an unjust man. Would that to be just or not? Thrasymachus answers that the just man would think that it just, that is just, but wouldn't ever be able to get what he deserves because he's, he'd be too high and mighty given that he's a just man. Thrasymachus and Socrates both agree that the unjust man thinks he deserves to get the better of everyone. Socrates sums up the position as it stands. Just people get the better of only unlike people, the unjust, whereas unjust people get the better of people both like and unlike, both just and unjust. Socrates asks about someone who is musical versus someone unmusical and someone knowledgeable about medicine versus not knowledgeable about medicine. Thrasmachus says that someone musical or knowledgeable about music is prudent, while someone unmusical or knowledgeable about medicine is thoughtless. Socrates asks whether a musical man thinks he deserves to do better than another musical man or a man who isn't musical. And Thrasmachus says that a musical man will want to do better than a musical man and says the same of a medical man. Socrates makes the questions more general and asks whether someone who is both good and wise will want to get the better of other good men, good and wise men, or just worst ones. Thrasymachus says only worst ones, while the ignorant and bad man will think he should get the better of both wise and ignorant men. However, Socrates points out that according to this model, the just man who gets the better only of that which is dissimilar to himself and not of that which is similar to himself, is therefore like the good and virtuous man, not the ignorant man. Thrasymachus was trying to compare him to. No, Socrates noticed that poor Thrasymachus is totally blushing. Socrates continues on, anyway, and asks whether injustice is still mighty, even if it isn't good and just. Thrasymachus says he remembers that part, but he's still not convinced by Socrates' conclusions, he says that Socrates won't even let him speak, since he'll just accuse Thrasymachus of making a scene. So Thrasymachus says he'll let Socrates just keep on questioning him, but he's just going to nod yes without really listening. Okay, says Socrates. Socrates wants to make sure they are very thorough about this whole, about justice. So he asks whether Thrasymachus thinks a city that tries to enslave other cities is just or unjust. Thrasymachus says it's definitely unjust and that for this reason it will be very strong. Socrates is delighted that Thrasymachus is answering his questions so well and Thrasymachus quips that he's just doing it to be nice to Socrates. Socrates grateful goes on to ask whether any community that as a whole acts unjustly could survive if its various members acted unjustly to one another. Thrasymachus says probably not, and he and Socrates agree that the reason for this is that un injustice causes factions and arguments that prevent unity. Socrates suggests that this could be true even without a single person. If injustice is part of this person, it will make him divided against his own self, which would provide would prevent him from being very powerful, right? Plus, Socrates adds, the gods like people who are sure of themselves and are able to make good choices. So if the unjust man isn't able to be sure of himself, being all divided, the gods won't let like him. Again, doesn't make him sound too powerful, does it? Socrates sums up where they stand by saying that clearly the just man is much better able to accomplish things what remains to be seen, he says, is whether justice allows someone to live better. Socrates wants to understand this concept of better and asks Thrasymachus whether what something do, does is determined by one, what it's capable of doing, or two, 
what it be does best, so you can only hear with your ears and see with your eyes. But take, say, a pruning knife, although you can do things other than prune with it, we still think of it as a pruning knife because it prunes best. Socrates and Thrasmachus agree that things that do a certain thing best also have their own virtue. So seeing, seeing might be the virtue of eyes, and hearing might be the virtue of ears. Without its virtue, an object wouldn't do its job well. So now Socrates wants to talk about souls and what they do best. Managing, organizing, living, that kind of thing. Socrates and Thrasmachus also agree that the soul will not do any of these things well if it lacks virtue. And this virtue is justice. Virtue to be to both being blessed and happy and so injustice can never be more profitable than injustice. Socrates thanks Thrust Smackers for pointing out this topic of conversation. He compares himself to a glutton at a banquet who grabs whatever he sees and just can't stop. He's hooked on philosophy. That concludes the summary to the Republic by Plato, Book One. Stay tuned for for Book Two on Plato's Republic.